may be seated for a second. I tell you, this year is just seemingly flying by. We turn the calendar and we're now in the month of August. Kids getting ready to go back to school for something that's wonderful news. <laughs> Then for those that may have to do it, it may not be quite so wonderful, but we thank God. We thank God that we have the privilege to be educated. But education really, the, the end result of education should be not that you receive the $100,000 a year job, although that's a major benefit of the primary purpose of an education is so that we would be better equipped to serve the Lord. If you would be so kind and turn to the gospel of Mark, just turn to it. We had, I'm not asking you to stand just yet, but just turn to the gospel of Mark. First, give an honor to God, to Jesus the Christ, who is my Lord and my Savior. To the Holy Spirit, which is our seal and guarantee of the redemption of our mortal bodies. To my wife, Rosalind, to my fellow yokemen of the gospel, to our deacons and their spouse, to our media ministry, music ministry, those who sang in the choir, ushers on the door to all of our visitors and to you, the royal family of God, known locally as the McKinney First Baptist Church. It is again a privilege and a pleasure to be able to stand before you and share with you what God has given me to share on this Sunday morning. And if you would please stand as you've already found the Gospel of Mark and flip over to the fifth chapter. We're going to read somewhat of an exhaustive narrative, but don't get too nervous about the number of verses and try to associate the sermon time with the verses. This is a narrative, so I want to read the whole picture so we can get a, a great glimpse of what God has to say. In the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 20, the Word of God says... Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had been dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he, he answered, saying, My name is Legion. For we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled and they told it 
in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. And tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. And we will use for a subject for today when Jesus comes on the scene. When Jesus comes on the scene, you may be seated. Mighty and everlasting God. Lord, I come to you right now. Lord, I need you right now to speak in and speak through me. Lord, what I'm sharing is exactly what you gave me. Therefore, with confidence, I will share it with your people, knowing that your word will not return void. It will accomplish what it was sent out to do. I am praying right now that everyone who may be bound by satanic forces, everyone who may have Satan's hand upon them, trying to keep them from doing what you are calling them to do. I am praying that today, Lord, you would make some people free. Father, we come to you right now in the strong and precious name of Jesus the Christ. Anoint me in your presence. Saturate me in your spirit that I may proclaim the uncompromised gospel. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, do I pray and give thanks. Amen. Ushers, you may be seated. I read an article about a missionary whose name was Jacob Koshi. Jacob grew up in Singapore, Malaysia. He had one driving ambition, and that was to be a success in life, to gain all the money and the possessions he could, and with unbridled enthusiasm and drive. Jacob fell into the world of drugs and gambling. And eventually, he became a kingpin of an international smuggling network. In 1980, Jacob was arrested. And he was placed in a government drug rehabilitation prison in Singapore. In prison, Jacob became depressed and frustrated, thinking all of my goals, all of my dreams, all of my ambitions are locked up with me in this little tiny cell. So his heart became filled with emptiness and despair. Now Jacob was a smoker, but cigarettes were not allowed in the prison. But Jacob still had some connections with the outside world, so he had tobacco smuggled into the prison. And what Jacob did is he would tear out pages of the, of the Gideon Bible that he was issued. And he would use the paper from the Bible to roll up his tobacco so he could smoke it. Now one day Jacob fell asleep while smoking. And he was awakened to a small fire in his cell for the cigarette had burned all the remaining pages that he was going to use from the Bible to roll up his tobacco. Well, all but one little small charred piece of paper. 
Jacob unrolled that small scrap of charred paper and there was only one verse that he could read. The verse was Acts chapter 9 and verse 4. Which says, then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jacob didn't understand why that one verse didn't burn up. But he felt compelled to ask for another Bible. He was reissued or given another Bible. And then he, first thing he did is he read the entire ninth chapter of Acts which is the factual account of the Damascus Road conversion experience of Saul to Paul. Jacob suddenly realized that if God could help somebody like Saul, somebody who murdered Christians, somebody who persecuted Christians, if God could help Saul, then God could help him too. So right there in his prison, he kneeled and he prayed, asking God to come into his life and change him. He began crying and he couldn't stop. He thought about the years that he had wasted following Satan's dream for him and not God's plan for him. But he believed by faith that God had saved him and the best was yet to come. Jacob started sharing his testimony right there in the prison with his fellow prisoners. And as soon as he was released, he was united with a Christian church. And he was actively involved in ministry. He met a Christian woman. They got married and he lived a missionary life in the Far East until his death. His new life ambition was to tell people far and wide Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. Church, there are times when Satan will cause people to think that they are beyond deliverance. Because of how far and maybe how long and deep that they are in sin. Satan tries to make married folk think that their marriage can't recover from a storm. There are people who have lost hope that their loved ones will ever change and be saved. But I stopped by to tell you something this morning. That it really doesn't matter how deep a person is in sin. It does not matter how powerful the stronghold on their life may be currently. God is able to deliver and make free. So with my text and the Holy Spirit as my guide, I'd like to briefly share with you three object lessons regarding the subject when Jesus comes on the scene. Object lesson number one. The love of God meets us right where we are. Now, one of the most awesome attributes about Jesus the Christ is the fact that Jesus is willing to come to us in our pitiful condition, in our worst mess. The Christian faith begins with Jesus coming to us and not us going to him. Romans 5 and 8 affirms this when it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we are still knee deep in sin, while we don't have Jesus on the brain, while we're running left, while we're being like Jonah and going to our Nineveh, Jesus already died for the sin that we are committing. He died for us. Praise God that, that he doesn't say, clean yourself up first, then come to me. Praise God he doesn't say, Get off drugs first and then you come to me. 
Praise God, he doesn't say stop gossiping or stop sowing seeds of discord first, then come meet me. No, Jesus is willing to come to us in the middle of our sin and rescue us. It is after we have been saved that we then experience and receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is the only power that is able to help us stop using drugs. The only power that can stop you from fornicating or committing adultery, to stop you from cursing, stop you from gossiping, and stop sowing seeds of discord. Praise God, he's willing to meet us in the middle of our mess. In our text, we discover something that we in America may find a little bit difficult to understand. Jesus intentionally, volitionally goes into a cemetery to meet a maniac. A man that was demon possessed. First, let's note the text. Let's look at what it says in verse 1 through 4 again. Let's note the condition of this man. Let's walk around the text again. In verse 1 it says, then he came to the other side of the country. To the country, other side of the sea rather, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the, out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him nor even not even with chains, because he had been bound with shackles and chains. The chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Now, first of all, we must understand that the ship that Jesus and the disciples were sailing on seemingly looked like it had been blown off course. Because if you go back to chapter 4, verses 35 to 38, they, the disciples were on the boat with Jesus and a great storm come up and the disciples were all worried. Jesus down there sleeping on the boat wasn't worried about anything because he the one in control of the storm. He says, peace be still. And the storm ceased. And then they, and, and then it would, if you look at that on the surface, it would look like they then unintentionally, because they got blown off course by the storm, they ended up in the Gadarenes. And when they get there, look who is Jesus' welcoming committee. A demon-possessed man. Now don't you miss this spiritual nugget. When we are in our storms, they are not always meant just for us. God will show up in your storm to deliver you and then steer you to another one who may be going through the same type of storm so that you can minister to them. This was not unintentional. The text reflects this man lived his life among the dead. He was sad, lonely, hurting. He felt unloved and unwanted and was living in a place nobody wanted to visit. How many of you intentionally go to the cemetery to just visit people there? Now, I know you go there to, like all of us do to put flowers on our, on our loved ones who've gone on, but you don't just say, hey, buddy, let's meet. Where you want to meet at? Let's go down to the cemetery. That is not a place. For meeting. Amen. I heard that loud. But Jesus intentionally and volitionally comes to meet this one man because this one man needs the gospel. It's amazing that Jesus is always on the move. Here he is, God the Son. You know, Jesus could have stayed in one place and had everybody just come to him. He, he could have set up shop, he could have set up headquarters in Jerusalem or some other coastal city and people would have lined up just to come meet him. But yet Jesus chose to go to the people and meet them in the middle of their greatest needs. 
Conversely, we the church must understand that we are uniquely positioned here at the McKinney First Baptist Church in this community by God to meet needs of this community, to go share the good news with those in our sphere of influence. And this is not the task just for the pastor or just for the evangelism ministry, but God desires that all of us go out into the community, go in on our jobs, among our family members, in our sphere of influence, and go plant seeds of salvation in the unsaved. Now again, this man was demon-possessed. So this entire scene in scripture on the surface seems very unreal to, to those of us who live here in the United States of America. But it wouldn't seem unreal if you've ever been on the mission field. In fact, most missionaries and Bible teachers believe demon possession is becoming even more prevalent in our day and age, in our modern society, than at any other time. Satan is a thief, according to John 10 and 10, whose purpose, whose sole job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We don't know how the demons entered this man, but we do know the end result that, that he was yielding to sin. He's, how I know that is because a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. See, there is inside, once you become a Christian, there is somebody that takes up residence in you called the Holy Spirit. Now, the, ho the Holy Spirit is far greater than Satan and his demons. Therefore, two spirits are not going to possess and be in the same person at the same time. Now, a Christian very, very, very much so can have what's called a stronghold on him. Matter of fact, most of us got some kind of stronghold on us because Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, lets us know that we all have some weights. We all have some signature sins that are beset before us. It's how we deal with them. It's how we, 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 st we stand up to them by standing on the word. There is a significant increase and the number of people who are being possessed by demons, and this is reflected, it reflects rather the fact that we are living in the end of end times. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, please make a note of this, these verses. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it says this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess, verse 3, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the anti Christ, of the Antichrist. Church, Adam Lanza, the young man who walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, that whereby he killed 26 people, including 20 children, this man was possessed by demon spirits. How else can a man walk up to a child and shoot them with, 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 with a gun that dismembers their body? James Holmes, the man who walked into the Aurora, Colorado movie theater and killed 12 people and wounded 70 more. He was, he was possessed by demonic spirits. Oh, we don't have to go quite that far. Young people today walking around with their pants about to fall on the ground, cursing, gang banging, committing drive-by shootings. They too are being possessed by evil spirits. All people who do not confess that Jesus is the Christ and he came to earth in human flesh 
fully God and fully man at the same time, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, which I just read, that represents the spirit of the Antichrist, which is now already on the earth. And those who are homosexual fit to a T what the Bible says about 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, and 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want to read that to you real quick because when I make this statement, I'm basing it on, on scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I had that verse marked and then I go and move it. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I know first, 2 Timothy is easy to find because it's right out of 1 Timothy. Actually, 1 Timothy 4, which says, now the, not 2 Timothy, that's why I didn't read right, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving doctrine, spirits, and doctrines of, e of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. When you fall into a thought process that is opposite the word of God, there is another power that is leading you there. It is God who says that he made them male and female. It is God's word in Genesis that says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and go cleave to his wife. Any ideology or thought process that says something opposite is from Satan and his demons. Now I know that's not palatable nor popular. Because most of us have somebody in our family that fall in that homosexual lineup. But you know what? We ought to still love them. We are still to reach out to them. It is nothing but the spirit of the living God that can change them anyway. For everyone who thinks I was born that way, I say to you from scripture, you can be born again. Notice verse 4 highlights the helplessness and the hopeless condition this man was in. When, he, when it says he could not be tamed. Hey, we're talking about a human being here. He could not be tamed. You tame monkeys, you tame dogs, you tame bears. How incurable his situation must have been for Mark, the gospel writer Mark, to say no one could tame him. Even the usage of chains was not effective because the demons were so powerful that they could break the chains. Now look with me at verses 5 to 7 which says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar he ran and worshipped him and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Notice his torment was continual. It happened day and night. He cried out in that place of isolation. He did his best to even injure himself, harm himself when it says that he cut himself with stone. You see, this, this type of thing is happening in our world right here, right now. I have personally witnessed folk doing this. When I was a member of Westside, we used to have an evangelism ministry that used to go on a regular basis to Texas Youth Correction Centers. And when I was in Mark, Texas, I had the privilege as I was meeting and talking to these youth that were in the facility. One of the guys that I was talking to was just released just the previous day before we came in. And when 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 I was talking to him, he he was he, he had on long. He had on short sleeve, but he kept his arms to himself. And then eventually, as we talked and we kind of got, you know, kind of got to know each other a little bit. He 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 got a little bit more comfortable and he and he would move his arms. And when he moved his arms, I could see what looked like hundreds of cut marks all over his arm. 
And one of the, 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 the gentlemen who worked in the facility, they said he's a cutter. And he says that they had about 10 of uh, other youth just like him. And what they would do is they tried, with, with their cutting was like a sign to let people know I'm hurting, I'm, I, I, there's a problem. But you know what, what does that? That when you don't have Jesus, when Jesus isn't in your life, Satan is going to come in. And he will convince us, what is his job? Steal, kill, destroy. What was happening then is happening right now and it's prevalent. They, they, they claim that this is a regular problem that goes on in, in those youth facilities. Surely this man wanted a different life. He, he, but he was absolutely powerless to accomplish that all by himself. Church, so it is with unsaved people today. You know, nobody wakes up in the morning and say, I want to be an alcoholic and a drug addict. Matter of fact, I want to be one so bad, I want to end up selling all the stuff out of my house. I want to have my wife or my children out on the street corner. I'm willing to sell my body. Nobody wake up in the morning and say, that's what I want to do. Nobody has as their goal in life, I want to be addicted to gambling or pornography. See, what happens is people, they begin dabbling in sin. See, Satan rarely just show up all at once with his greatest plan. What he do is he try to get you just to put your little pinky toe, put your pinky finger, your pinky toe in the water. Just let it dabble. And when he can get you in there just a little bit, then it's like a hook. See, if you've ever fished before, you know on the hook there's a thing called a bar. It's easy to get on it, but oh Lord, it's hard to come off of it. Matter of fact, you don't get off of it by yourself. Somebody, you need some help to get off of it. Every day, like a man struggling in quicksand, the one with an addiction, or even the Christian with a satanic stronghold, falls deeper and deeper into their pit of isolation, wretchedness, and entrapment. But thank God that our Lord Jesus the Christ he says in 2 Peter 3 and 9, he's not willing that any should perish. So when the demon, when, when the demon possessed man saw that Jesus had come on the scene, verse 6 says, he ran and worshiped him. See, not although the pull of Satan and his strongholds can almost seem like they're overwhelming in our life. They are not more powerful than the power of God. Too often they show us in movies where it's the battle of good and evil. They try to show Satan whispering in your ear, Jesus whispering in your ear. They're about the same size. It looked like it's an equally matched kind of fight. But let me tell you something. Jesus wins 100% of the time when he's going, when Satan comes up against him. It's not an equal match. It's a match mismatch now I know this morning in every church in America and right here at TMFBC the pull of Satan is mighty on most of us but yet we have the sense to come to church and worship on Sunday morning because no matter how the devil has you tangled up in sin, Jesus can make you free. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now note the text did not say set you free, but make you free. Why? Because if you set something free, it can get caught again. But if you made free, the Bible says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. The demon possessed man finds himself at the feet of the only one in the universe who could help him. Thank God that Jesus wasn't content to leave that man to wallow in his wretched condition. Thank God Jesus crossed that, that sea went through that storm just to reach that one person. 
One of the most unique things about this story, about this factual account in the Gadarenes, is that if you read about this, there is no other time you read about the Gadarene, that area in the Bible. That Jesus didn't do but one thing at this area. And that is, he met that one man at his point of need. So what is that telling us? There is nowhere you can go. There is nothing that you can do that Jesus is willing and ready to come show up wherever you are to meet you right where you are. Object lesson number two. God's power is greater than any stronghold from Satan. Now in verses 1 through 9, the man is wild. He's cutting himself. He's untamed. He's uncontrollable. But in verse 8, something happened. Jesus comes on the scene. The man moves from a sad condition to the Savior's conversion. Look with me at verses 8 through 10. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. You see, that which this man could not do alone was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. One word from Jesus and this man was made free. He was forever changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this text bears out this. That this man's life was totally and radically changed for the better. Church, this is the kind of thing that happens when, you, when Jesus passes by. It doesn't matter what your signature sin is. You may have been doing it for years. You may feel like you can never stop smoking. You may feel like you're going to never stop drinking. Well, let me, me, me rephrase that. You're going to never stop getting drunk since drinking in and of itself is sin. You're never going to stop cursing. Never stop gambling. Never stop fornicating or committing adultery. You may feel like you're never going to stop lying or gossiping. But you cannot have a problem that is greater than God's ability to solve it. Oh, remember what a difference. What a difference this power made when the woman with the issue of blood, a 12-year issue of blood, what happened when Jesus showed up. In Luke chapter 8, it tells us she spent her livelihood. Every dime that she had, she spent it on the doctors. But the doctors couldn't heal her. But one day... Jesus came walking by. He came on the scene and she just touched the hem of his garment. And the text says immediately the flow of blood stopped. Oh, what a difference Jesus makes when he came into the life of blind Bartimaeus. In Mark chapter 10, Bartimaeus was just seated on the road. He was begging. He didn't have his sight. He heard somebody say that Jesus was on his way. Then Bartimaeus got him a good seat. He went and found him a place because he heard that if Jesus come walking by, something might happen. Then all of a sudden, Bartimaeus didn't let church folk stop him from worshiping. He wasn't worried about somebody hunching him in the shoulder saying, I know he ain't up there worshiping. No, Bartimaeus said, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus, because of the faith that Bartimaeus had in him, he received his sight. Oh, no, I can do one more. When, when Jesus came on the scene about four days after Lazarus was put, to, to, was put in a tomb, it looked like death had defeated Jesus. Look like the cries of Mary and Martha went off in the wind, wind the wind. But when Jesus showed up on the scene four days later, Jesus did something, y'all. He went to that tomb. He went exactly to the spot they put Lazarus. 
He gave and a spoke a specific word. Because if he didn't, he wasn't specific, everybody might have got up. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus got up out of that tomb, y'all. Bound with, with, with his grave clothes on. Face wrapped with cloth. Then Jesus said, loose him. Let him go. I don't care what you're struggling with this morning, church. No matter how powerful the strongholds are in your life, if you invite Jesus to come on the scene, he can say to your sickness, he can say to your poverty, he can say to your gambling, drug, or alcohol addiction, he can say to your sexual immorality, he can say to the demons trying to keep your marriage in bondage, loose him, loose her, and let him go. In verses 11 through 14, they let us know that the demons left that man. Into the herd of swine, about 2,000 of them. The swine, the pigs run off a cliff and they're drowned. Jesus, by sending the demons into the pigs, desired to provide proof to all the spectators that a miracle of deliverance had taken place. The Lord was also providing a major warning to the people against the powers of Satan and the penalty of unconfessed sin. And the warning was, the wages of sin is death. Those pigs didn't do anything. They, 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 they simply were possessed by the demons and they went over. You could be doing nothing, but if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you allow yourself to be possessed by Satan, by his demons. And if you allow that to happen, just like these pigs went off a cliff, Satan want to see you go off a cliff. Now in verses 15 through 17, we see the workers who tended to the pigs. They didn't want to be blamed, so they look what they did. The text said they immediately ran to tell the owners what had happened. I don't blame them. I don't want to get blamed, be, get, be blamed for something I didn't do either. And when the owners arrived on the scene, they see that the former demon-possessed man, look at him now, sitting down, clothed in his right mind. And what, did, and what happened to them? And they were afraid. Notice in verses 1 through 7, it says nothing about the people were afraid of the man when he was out cutting himself, when he was out walking around naked, acting a fool. They wasn't afraid of him then. But when he got in his right mind, when he sat down, act like he got some sense, all of a sudden they scared of him. Because they know there's a power that's greater than them, a power that came over them. God will give you an anointing when you submit to him. Folks will respect you even if they don't like you. He was also very interesting to note that instead of them asking Jesus to stay on the scene, because there's some other folk that had the same problem as that demon-possessed man, what did they do? They say, Jesus, you got to get up out of here. They would rather give up Jesus than lose the source of their income and security. It's no different today. You think people who put out pornographic sites don't know that that kind of stuff can help lead people to doing other sexual immoral, immoral things? But do you see them taking it off the web page? Do you, do you hear them saying, ooh, this is going to hurt marriages, therefore I'm not going to put it on. No, they know they can make money off of it. Therefore, they don't care about that. That's the same way these men saw Jesus. I just want to make my living. I don't care about who saved, who ain't saved. I just need my check. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And the Lord does not stay where he's not wanted. So he left. Finally, object lesson number three as we run to a close. Evangelism must be a priority of the believer. Look with me again at verse 18. And when he got into the boat, 
And he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. After this man was saved from a horrendous lifestyle, he wanted nothing more than to be with Jesus. You see, when you are authentically saved, spending time with the Lord is prioritized. And your devotion time is like breathing air. You would die without it. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness will become your lifestyle, not a verse you quote to want to sound spiritual and holy. God's word is a treasure chest to be explored and enjoyed. Worship is an event that should not be missed. I cannot understand. Some of y'all might get mad at me, but you're going to be mad at Jesus because he gave it to me. Some of you all come in church so frequently late that you miss praise and worship. You miss where the power get plugged into the worship experience. I'm telling you from experience. When you allow the praise and worship. See everything start right here. It's, this is where Jesus is coming into this place and he's putting his salt and pepper on it. He's, he's getting the meat ready so that when he put it in the oven, when the pastor preached the word, then you ready to eat it. Try eating some meat that hadn't been seasoned right now. Those of us from Louisiana, we know we can't eat it without some seasoning on it. We, we got we to gotta put a little this, a little that. I don't care what the recipe say. We're going we gonna to put our own dashes on it. But when you season it just right, when it come out of that oven, whoa, it smell good. Whoa, it tastes good. That's what the praise and worship is about. It's about getting the atmosphere right. It's about coming in and saying, God, all that time I spent with you by myself this week, now from the overflow of that time I spent with you, I now get to come inside of here with my fellow brothers and sisters. Now I can shout with some folk who can shout with me. Now I can say hallelujah with some folk that, that's going through something just like me. I encourage you. I'm not trying to point, point you out. I'm encouraging you. Don't miss the praise and worship. It's, the, it's where the plug go into the power to bring out all God has in the worship experience. God will take you places to a level of worship in community that he cannot nor will not take you individually. Why? Because God is the one who told us to forsake not the assembly of ourselves. So when we come together, there's something about corporate worship that can only be experienced in corporate worship. Look at verses 19 through 20 as we run to a close. Verse 19 says, however, Jesus didn't permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And all marveled. Wow. Surely the Lord was thrilled by this man's love for him. Jesus knew there were others, however, that needed to hear the gospel just like this man. Therefore, Jesus sends him home. With the instructions, go tell the others what the Lord has done for you. Too often I hear people say, Pastor, I'm afraid to go witness. I, I, especially to a stranger, I, I don't know what to say. The model is right here in the text. Go tell somebody else what God has done for you. There is no more authentic testimony than your personal testimony of what God has done for you. We got to go. And we got to tell others. 
Because the reason many of us are in the storms that we're in right now is God is using that, using that as a seasoning for us so that when we go out and, and, and minister to somebody else, you will be able to authentically let them know, I, I, I don't know how you feel in this situation. However, I've been in one just like you. Let me tell you what God did for me. And just as he's done it for me, he can do it for you. You got to go tell people there is a power that can remake life. There's a power that can transform life. And you got to say it with conviction. You got to say it at like, like, like he's done it for you. So often folk come into church, they're not saved. And they're coming in here, they say, wait a minute, you Christian folk talk, y'all say that, that Jesus is providing for your every need. You saying all this happy stuff. Why come I don't see it on you? They walk in here and they look at us and we look like we done ate a bowl of sour grapes. We don't want to tell them what good things the Lord has done. That's why I had to ask you when I first started the, the, the worship experience, stand up and give God some praise because we are not going to come here on Sunday morning and act like Jesus isn't real. Church, when this redeemed man heard the will of the Lord for his life, don't miss this. Notice he didn't hesitate. He didn't say, well, Lord, uh, uh, you saved me, but I, I need to go back over here and I got to put my stones back together. I got to uh, align them back in the place I found them. He didn't, he didn't hesitate. He left everything that was behind him, everything that was holding him back, everything that was trouble. He left that and he went forward with Jesus and he did it immediately. And that's the same thing he want us to do. When he, when God knows that for some of us, if I deliver you from the mess in your marriage, you're going to turn around and go do it all over again. He's waiting to change you on the inside. He's waiting to, to change us on the inside. He know if he take, he, he release some from prison, he know they're going right back to do the same thing they were doing. It's not until the change happens on the inside. It's not until the heart is changed. It's not until the transformation takes place. Then God can say, now you're ready to go. Now I'm ready to deliver. Now I'm ready to release. Now I'm ready to make free. See, you can fool me sometimes. You can fool your spouse and others sometimes. But you can't fool God no time. He knows what we are planning to do before we even do it. And when you get to the point that you say, Lord, here's where we got to learn how to be real. Lord, if you don't do something, if you don't hold me, if you don't keep me, I am going back to that same thing. But I come to you recognizing that I can't do it in my strength. I come to you like and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I can't do it by myself. That's when God know you're real. That's when God ready to make you free. That's when God ready to deliver you. That's when God ready to touch your marriage. That's when he ready to bring your boy home from jail. That's when he ready to bring your girl off the street. When they get to that point that they're tired of being tired, that they say, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on me. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Let us pray. Oh Lord. I struggle with this text. I know Satan got most of us. With a signature weakness. We're finding ourselves. Going back. Saying the same. Doing the same. Acting the same. But Lord, today, today, Lord, not tomorrow, not the day after, but today we're coming to you. We're coming to you, Lord, and we're saying, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. 
Have mercy on my situation. Have mercy on my marriage. Have mercy on my children. Have mercy on our church. Have mercy on our community. Have mercy on all the unsaved people. Have mercy. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy. We need you to deliver us. Not set us free, but make us free. Because we don't want to get caught no more. And we recognize we can't do it unless you do what only you can. I'm believing by faith that the struggle of this text is because you get ready for some breakthroughs. You get ready to touch some marriages. You get ready to bring some kids out of prison. You get ready to deliver some who go into school with bad thoughts, with bad plans and bad attitudes. You're ready to deliver them right now. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we yield, we surrender, withholding nothing. Have your way in our life. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, I pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. And amen. Would all, all of our deacons swiftly and our counselors, our ministers, please come join me. The doors of the church are now open. I believe in my spirit today. Somebody out there is really wrestling with a stronghold. Wrestling with something that is far greater and stronger than you. I encourage you today. Turn it over to Jesus. You can come up and allow one of our ministers or deacons to pray with you about it. Because the Bible tells us to pray for one another. Help bear one another's burdens. Doors of the church are open. If there's anybody here who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And you would like to give your life to Christ today. The invitation is first open to you. Is there one in the house today? <coughs> Doors of the church are open. Is there one in the house today that, that want to make that decision? You're ready to become actively involved in a church. You've been visiting, but now it's time to move from visiting to committing. All I can say to you is that this Bible is the one and only way hallelujah this is where we teach we preach from everything we are going to do is going to line up with this word hallelujah is there another in the house today I need a prayer warrior praying right now in my spirit somebody wrestling right now pray right now pray for deliverance right now pray that they give it all to the Lord you don't have to physically come up here to do that you can do it right where you're sitting you can say Jesus today I give this to you I, I, I can't go no further trying to do it on my own I yield to you right now you watch what the Lord do you may be in a lifestyle sin God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we could ask think or imagine is there another in the house Is there one who is saved and not baptized? And not that baptism means that your Christianity is authenticated. You get baptized out of obedience to Jesus because that's something he desires for us to do. 
Just like he desires that we exercise the Lord's Supper. There's nothing about salvation. You don't get saved because you eat this bread and drink and, and drink the grape juice. You save, and because you save, you eat the bread and drink the grape juice. Is there another? As we're about to go into the Lord's Supper.